keep your letters. You know, save okay. your time. Um, the recording went on. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, so if, it's, if it's my own house, like save your letters, but people do like the letters. Um, when I'm representing a seller though, I push them to not look at the letters unless we need it for, you know, two identical offers. But when you're going to write the letters, I think it's important to keep them short, sweet, to the point. Don't make them sappy. Don't get into your personal medical. I don't care about your in vitro problems. I mean, some of the letters that I've received, I swear to God, I want to write a book. It's just like the, the stuff people tell is amazing. Um, but I think it's important too to talk about your financial situation, especially with some of these first time home buyers. You know, talk about the fact that you've been saving your money and you have, you're very proud of the fact that you have enough cash to be able to put 20% down and all of your closing costs. And I think between that and like, like what April was saying, you know, telling them that the realtor that you're working with is a good realtor. We've made good decisions. We've made good financial decisions. You know, you need to prove as a buyer to a seller that you are a good risk. Nobody cares that you're going to have Christmas there and Johnny's birthday because the seller's not going to be there for that. They just want to know that you're going to be able to give them X amount of dollars and it's going to close like you said it is. And that's the key thing there. And I think that's why it's important to have the letter that says, these people are well qualified. They're diligent. I'm a great realtor. My team is fantastic. Here's the lender. The lender's now emailing or calling and saying, hey, Johnny is, they're great people. They're well qualified. We've got everything ready to go. All those little pieces of the puzzle make it so when the sellers, the agent sits down with the sellers and you talk about offers, you know, you get to a point where you've got your top three. I think one I did recently, we had 15 offers and our first number one goal, I put it in my spreadsheet and I said, okay, we need to narrow this down to three. And right away, we literally went through and we flat out said, okay, well, let's look at the price. Crossed out like six of them right away because of price, because we already had you know, somebody that were above asking. And then from there, we just narrowed it down. And it, it's amazing how it, you get kicked out very quickly. And, and the conversation I have with buyers is unfortunately, in a situation like that, we were left, I think it was seven offers. Two of them had inspections and four of them did not. So guess what? Two of them went out because we didn't want to have to deal with inspections. The one we ended up with was cash, but you know, the top three were not all cash. But I think that the the letter needs to be important. Um, and the other one piece I want to touch base on is if you're going to write it um, up an over asking price, you have to address the appraisal gap. You absolutely have to address the appraisal gap in paragraph 10. As a listing agent, if you don't address the appraisal gap and I have to call you and ask for it, it's kind of like not filling out the financing information. You know, if the house is listed at 220 and you're going in at 230 and you're doing an escalation clause up to 240, what happens when it doesn't appraise? You know, let's say it appraises at 220 and we accepted your 240 offer. Who's covering that? And I think you absolutely have to address it. If you can't address the whole thing, you know, I'm not sure that you should have written an offer that high, but I know some people don't have the cash, but they can afford it. So I think that is a piece that needs to be addressed. Hey, we don't have all the cash, but we have incredible credit. We don't owe a lot. We just, you know, we can afford even more than 240. And you need to tell them in this market, I think it's important to say, we can afford more than 240. And we've got enough though to cover $15,000 of an appraisal gap. And then- Raquel, we have two people raise their hands here. Yeah. Peter, oh, Peter, Peter yeah. you go first and then Jody. We can't hear. Peter? Unmute yourself. Yeah, can't hear you. It doesn't appear to be muted. I think his sound just wasn't on. Yeah, okay. Jody, you wanna jump in and then Peter, you can jump in after. I just wanna piggyback a couple of things. Um, read the MLS notes and Raquel, you may have addressed this. It, my connection went bad for a while there, but read the MLS notes. The listing agent is going to put a lot of information in there, including probably when they're presenting the offer. So if they're presenting Sunday at one o'clock, don't make your expiration Sunday at one o'clock. Give it some cushion time so that it's cleaner and easier for the listing agent. Um, I would also recommend don't call the listing agent as soon as they've presented offers, because if they're dealing with 
15 offers, they will call you. I promise you, they'll call you back. Don't be a pain. Um, what I summarize my offer, like you were talking about as well, April, I, I don't go quite to that extent, but I do include it in the email. I think it's easier for the listing agent to be aware of. Um, and I've had agents who have sent every document in a separate email, which is crazy. So you've got 15 offers and then you end up with 15 emails from one agent. So put things together concisely. Um, make sure your pre-approval letter is at or above your offer price. I think we've all gotten those pre-approval letters that are less than what the person is offering. So, and fill in the loan amount. And if you don't know how to do that, there are a lot of people who will help you learn how to do that so that you are presenting an offer that is the best written um, just to make it as simple. And you don't want to be the agent that the listing agent has to come after you and ask for the pre-approval letter and ask for different things. Just be thorough with it. And I'm sure you guys have done trainings on how to put offers together and how to write good offers. And the, I haven't been with Better Homes that long. So, but I'm sure that's happened previously. So I know there are a lot of people that would be willing to help. Just my two cents. Super, that was, that was more than two cents, Jody. Thank you. Peter, you had your hand raised also. Hey, sorry about that. Okay. Um, I just wanted to and kind of reiterate what Raquel said. Obviously, I do business. As you know, Jen and I are pretty no-nonsense. Uh, we write on the offer, uh, leave the keys on the counter and get out. That's about it. Mm -hmm. So um, we also, we would never get a pre-approval letter from a buyer that isn't the highest they could ever see themselves writing on a house. So right. if you're pre-approved to 400000 I don't care if you're buying 350. I want a pre-approval letter because lenders still don't work when realtors work. And until lenders start working the same time as realtors work, then I want a pre-approval letter that I can see on Sunday and I can send to somebody on Sunday. And also, and I, I, I never mind that I, I have an investor whose pre-approval letter says $3 million. He's never bought anything over 300,000. But uh, if I'm going under contract with somebody, I want somebody to be affluent. Um, and as far as the letters, uh, I, I mean, I got an offer last, I mean, they're great agents. Uh, they're with another company, they're great agents, but it ended five, six, she said, well, she called me of course and said, Pete, it's going to have to go really high, isn't it? What do you think about 10% over? And of course I'm the seller's agent and my job is to get the most in the shortest amount of time. So every single, every single time I'm asked that question, I say, that's, I don't know if that's going to make it. I, I say, I don't know if that's going to make it to any number they give me. They could give me 55% over. And I would still say, I don't know if that's going to make it because my job is to get the most in the shortest amount of time. So anyway, they ended the purchase price with 152. So 567, 152, because this is their first house and it's on 52nd Street. I don't know about feng shui. I don't know about any of that stuff. But what I know about is money and my clients like the most of it. So, I mean, it's a very good indicator of who lives where, not what the agent feels or whether it's an investor or if the agent, if they smiled at the agent just right. A really good determinant of where people live is how much money they pay for what they, what they buy. So uh, I, I just wanna kind of give my two cents. Um, also, uh, we started doing this recently and uh, this is kind of a trade secret, but I'll let you use it. We talk to the parents and if the parents can buy the home cash, then the parents are my buyers, not the kids. Uh, we get houses because the parents buy them and put in the offer that it can be financed and then the kids finance it. We all know the kids can finance it, but if we can make this offer cash in any way possible, we're going to get the house over someone else every single time. And to watch parents sit back with loads of cash in their pockets and watch their kids struggle and lose on 16 houses is absolutely ridiculous when all they have to do is say that if my kids cannot get financed, I will back it with cash. And that's a cash offer. It is backed with cash. If the financing doesn't go through, it will be paid cash. Guess how many times we've had the parents buy the house? Zero. Zero times have we had the cash. We had one that was 580, just closed on Friday. The mother buy, said they were going to buy the house, but gave an option for financing. And of course, the kids are both well approved. We just couldn't get them approved because we hadn't got them approved. It was a Sunday and we needed to buy the house. Also, 
Jen Manhart invented the idea of we will never write another offer that isn't six hours. You have six hours to respond. The reason why is because I'm not taking my client off of the buying market for five days while you guys drag your feet. Don't ask me. Don't say that you can't can't get a hold of the seller. It's all bullshit. Everybody has a phone in their pocket. So we all of our offers are six hours. If they expire, they expire. My client knows that if the offer expires, the offer expires. The good part is my client, if the house of their dreams today is a different house tomorrow, then they can buy that house tomorrow and they're not tied up with writing an offer on Thursday and then being off the market till Tuesday. It's just ridiculous. But again, we write really good offers and those really good offers get accepted very quickly. And uh, just a quick, very quick story. We wrote an offer for 580, that one that I was talking about. Uh, another buyer called me, the buyer, not their agent. The buyer called me directly and said, you, you put a house out today and I'm flying from Denver. This is the third time I'm flying from Denver and do not sell it to anyone else because I just lost out on a house up the street on 58th street. I said, oh, you mean the one that was 580 or 5, 550? He said, yeah, how do you know about that? I said, because my client got it. And after he was pissed for about five seconds, he realized he was talking to the exact person he needed to talk to to find out what he should write on the house when he flies from Denver today. And literally, I said, can you hold on? I called my client. I asked what I could disclose to this buyer. I called the buyer back and literally, outside the price, crafted the offer that I received later that day and accepted later that day. And guess what? It was all cash. Was he doing it before all cash? No, because he didn't think he could, but his parents could. Peter. So I understand, I understand that not everybody has rich parents. Hey, Trudy. Hey, Peter, I got a question for you. Um, when you write a, a cash, you know, not contingent on financing and they have the option to finance, are the, are the kids' names on that contract also? They all are. Okay. And then the mother is removed. And then okay, the mother would be, and then the mother would be removed because the mother doesn't want to buy it and then have right. to go through the process yeah. of, because sometimes they make you wait six months and they do that. That was the missing so, link for me. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. So what I'll say is, and the mother is, I think the mother wanted the house more than the kids did. So anyway, it worked out really well. Oh. Do you address the appraisal issue then? Because obviously. Oh, of course. Cash. That was another thing I was going to mention when you talked about the idea that we would ever get an offer that addresses an appraisal gap and not have a proof of funds with yes. that offer. I mean, agents are just lucking out. What's happening is they're saying they're going to, they're lucking out because all these appraisals are coming in. Well, you know, as well as I do in the last few weeks, things are changing and these appraisals are all going to come to fruition. And these agents are going to be in deep, deep water when they put their people into contracts with a covering appraisal gaps that absolutely, you know, so we have proof of funds. And remember, these are proof of funds. They have to have their down payment, all the closing costs and the $10,000. So that's why we love offers. Everybody says, why do you love offers with a lot of money down? Well, because if you're putting 20% down and appraisal gap comes, you can just switch to 10% down or 15% down and make up that appraisal gap. So Jen and I are not as worried when they're putting a lot down, but if they're putting 5% down, something like that, and they don't address the appraisal gap, one, we're, we realize we're not working with an agent who's really covering all the bases, which worries us. And uh, two, we're just not doing the best for our sellers if we don't collect that proof of funds for the appraisal yet. Can I add to that? I, I think in, the, in a nutshell, when you write an offer for somebody, you have to A, be able to prove everything that you're writing. Mm -hmm. And like Pete said, if you're doing an appraisal gap and I, I give my people a worst case scenario, here's your offer. And here's the escalation. And if it only appraises at the list price, if we escalate it all the way up, like here's the worst case scenario for you. I need you to prove that 20% and that extra 10, 15, $20,000. And I think if that's something that you can provide up front and you can put your money where your mouth is, so to speak, but make an offer and prove it. I know I can do this. I've got a great team. I know we're going to get this done. This lender is amazing. These buyers are amazing. Here, we've got proof that we've got the money answer all the questions, any questions as a listing agent that you think you would have, if you don't answer it, address it, fill in the blank or whatever, you know, just answer the question and prove it. You're leaving open-ended questions that if there's multiple offers, it's so easy in this business. When you've got 15 offers to choose from, 
I don't have time to do your job for you. I've got so many other offers to work with. And so I think, like Pete said, I agree. I think it just comes down to highest and best as far as purchase price. And so well, and they can't, the lender, the lender can't say anything bad about the person anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, this guy could be, this guy could have $7 to his name and the lender would say, you know, as long as they can get approved that, you know what I mean? So to me, it's not as, what I'm always saying to the lender is, do they have any family member that might be able to help with the down payment? You know, have you talked to them about that? Because we have times when, when people have family members, but they don't, they haven't, nobody's really talked to them about that. But anyway, yeah, that's why I'm not, a, I'm not about the letters. And what I'll tell you is a letter fooled, not fooled us, but it was a divorcee. She had a bunch of kids. We had eerily similar offers. The seller went with her because they wanted a big family. Well, guess what? Divorcees with a lot of kids sometimes get emotional toward the end and make it absolutely miserable for your sellers with these, what's the dry, that drywall, there's a shadow, there's this, I'm an agent and I want to be an inspector. You know what I mean? Like that is really dry. So just be careful with, if you're portraying your buyer as this lovely, loves puppies and, and everything, just remember that that could be, could be construed as the idea that this person is really emotional and emotional people do different, do different things than, you know, matter of fact, people who, you know, save their money. Yeah. That type of thing. So just, just remember, don't get too crazy with these letters because they could be construed as a somewhat emotional person that may, because remember until judges start forcing people to buy homes, cold feet is always, is always out there. So let's wrap this up. We've got a couple more minutes and let's, Kristen, Kristen, you have you, whatever you've got for last, last words here. Oh, I would, yeah, I was just going to answer Katie's um, question unless anybody else already answered it to your okay. satisfaction about how long for offer expiration. I just wasn't sure because it just, I know it's case dependent, but I don't want to tick listing agents off, but I also want to, you know, have my client's best interest. Sure, sure. As Pete says, he gives six hours, period. Um, I look at what's been stated in the MLS. If they're reviewing offers at a certain time, I try to give two hours after that to get the answer in. Um, but if there are no specific days after talking to that listing agent, if they don't have a specific time to review, um, if I'm not going to get it into them until 10 o'clock at night, I'm not going to have them respond in six hours, you know, obviously. I try to give them till at least noon or 6 p.m., depending on when I get it in. Just because a lot of my clients, if I know that maybe it's a doctor that's selling the house, their offer or their... Uh, that's a question. That would be a question, though, that I would be asking the agent. Yeah, exactly. Because if you have an older couple or it's an estate, especially in the state, you might have four or five kids that have to make a determination and you can put six hours, but I'm telling you now it's going to take me six days. But um, I, I agree. Look at the agent mm remark. -hmm. Just because they say they're not looking at offers until Sunday, I'm actually having my sellers, if they agree to that, I'm getting that in writing. Um, and I did put in my last one I just did. I said, we're looking at offers on Wednesday. Make your expiration according. No exceptions. Don't. Don't yeah, and I don't, I don't do that with everyone. Just the better the offer, the less time I'm going to give you. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. the way we look at it. And yeah. on that note, Pete, I think that's perfect. Don't go in on a two fifty half right two fifty inspections closing in sixty days and say, "Oh, I want an answer in two hours." Right. The answer. answer is no. The answer is no. Yeah. Wait, okay, I got to go show. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Okay. April, you Bye have guys. anything as a final wrap up? I'm muted. Oh, I just said, nope, that was a lot of fun, you guys. I love these uh, open conversations. Amazing, good, amazing. Great conversation. If you weren't writing these down, there was there was a ton of them. Um, but the one I, th I think that I heard from all of you is the most important is get as much information as you can, connect with the other agent, make sure your team is on board, Fill out all the all the papers, every single dot, every I and every T. Know your know your client, have them ready, and uh, I say one, do it. I'll say one final thing: if you do have a buyer and you've written let's say five offers or more and you're getting beat out, 
take a moment and talk with your buyer about what they're writing and why they're getting beat out. Try to find out why your offer didn't get accepted so that you can help that buyer change what they need to change if they can, and then write offers accordingly. doesn't always help, but I think it, after you've written four or five offers, you need to kind of reevaluate what you're doing and see what can be changed. Like I like Pete's idea. Can your parents help out? In fact, the gal I'm going to go show now, mom's going to put the down payment down so she doesn't have to sell her house. It's perfect. Right. Yeah. And feel free to call anybody that was on this panel, mm -hmm. any one of us um, who contributed in any way. We're always here to help um, with every single individual offer because they're all different. Every single day, they're different. Perfect. And um, the pace that we are under is different. So um, right now, I think there's a little bit of a breath to be able to at least stop and think. Um, and But every day, we should be getting smarter. So Next week will be Tom. Tim will be there. Leslie will probably join us. Oh, Tim, you won't. Tim's going to be in Alaska. Alaska. I'm going to Alaska. Yes. Wow. Okay. Well, no, we don't even, we don't want you here. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, anything, okay. anything else? Thank you, everybody, for joining Thank us. Thank you. Uh, always appreciate it. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.